Radical Health Radio, welcome back to the show. Today in the studio virtually, I had Natalie and Tara from the Discover Ag podcast. Two powerhouse women in agriculture doing it the modern way. They've got a podcast, they are boots on the ground, they are generational farmers and ranchers themselves. One focused in dairy and one focused in beef. So we talk about a lot of labels and sometimes the danger and the confusion with labels. What are the real differences between conventional farming and regenerative? generative farming. We talk about Natalie's experience of visiting feedlots and what's that really like? Not often what it gets portrayed as, as some of these Netflix documentaries like Cowspiracy and What the Health that often paint the conventional farming model in a really terrible light. So we talk about raw milk versus conventional and we talk about ultimately just combating some misinformation and nuance and the search for truth in this very confusing time so that you can rid yourself of food anxiety, make empowered choices, support your local farmers if that's what you want to, but you don't need to do that in all cases all the time because you might learn some surprising truths about conventional farming as well. So it's an interesting conversation and I think you'll learn a lot about farming as I did. So let's get into the show. Radical Health Radio, welcome back to the show. Today, I've got two powerhouse ladies in the studio virtually with me, um, Tara and Natalie from the Discover Ag Pod. So I wanna get the background and the story here because for me, uh, before I got into this world, a few years ago, you've asked me about a farmer and I get this stereotypical image in my head of like a kind of fat white dude in his 50s, you know, just out there with his, you know, plaid on and his cowboy hat on. And here we have, you know, these, these, you know, bright, young, good looking women out there ranching and farming. So like, what, what, tell us the story. What got you into this world? Whoever wants to take the floor first, like give it a whirl. Yeah, Tara here. I'll go first. It's funny you say that about the farmer. Um, whenever I give my speech, I Googled one time farmer because I wanted an image for um, my presentation. And the first thing that came up was, you know, a middle aged man in overalls, like chewing on a piece of wheat. And it was Perfect. just like, how is that the only image that comes up uh, on Google? Uh, but no, I actually grew up on a dairy farm. I'm a fifth generation dairy farmer. And now I dairy farm with my husband and our two girls on his family farm. Um, I actually did get my I got my degree in environmental science and didn't necessarily see myself coming back to the farm, actually. Mm. And then as you know, um, life would have it. I ended up marrying my husband who was a dairy farmer. And so I ended up back on his family farm, as I mentioned. And then, you know, as I was, you know, working in the environmental space, um, I was just seeing a ton of misinformation online about dairy, the impact of cattle on the environment, and really saw a need to start kind of like sharing you know, what I do, opening up our farm to, you know, the internet, to social media, and ultimately doing so led me to meet Natalie online. Um, we obviously have some distance between us, me being in New Mexico and her being in mm -hmm. Nebraska, uh, but social media brought us together, which is uh, how we ended up with our podcast, Discover Ag. Very cool. Very cool. Natalie, what's your story? Yeah, it's actually um, eerily similar to Tara's. So I grew up in agriculture as well. I grew up um, on a cattle ranch in Southwest Montana. So a lot of people instinctively think of Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm here to myth best a little of the um, disparity there. But I also got my degree outside of agriculture. I went to pharmacy school and I was practicing as a full-time pharmacist in a, you know, bigger city in Montana, which again is a relative term for that state. Mm. But I was really happy. You know, I was close to our family ranch and I spent a lot of time there, but I definitely didn't envision, you know, living on a ranch, having my income drive from ranching and just being, I guess, as involved in production ag as I am to this day. Uh, like Tara, that changed when I met and married my husband. And that's how I ended up here in Nebraska, where we um, own and operate our ranch here. Um, a little bit different than Tara, I ended up sharing online because I started a direct-to-consumer beef business. Um, I started that about five years ago with a childhood I fr mm -hmm. friend I had who also was ranching. And so I did that for a couple of years. But ultimately, um, you know, as you get started, you kind of, as Tara mentioned, you start seeing misinformation. And so I ended up stepping away from the direct-to-consumer beef business and kind of creating more of a brand online that just shared more about the agriculture industry and then more about our personal operation. And then as Tara said, that eventually led us to each other and to starting, starting our podcast, Discover Ag. 
That's super cool. I'm excited to pick your brains on a few things here. And you mentioned misinformation. That's a big one. The first one, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a little disappointed to hear that uh, Yellowstone isn't cowboys <laughs> running around blowing up cars and John Dutton and all of that stuff. So that's kind of heartbreaking. But I think, yeah, you've probably got a more realistic insight to that cowboy or cowgirl life, which is pretty cool. But you both said what's interesting to me, like this tackling, like feeling the need almost to come back, you know, going into more of the science world and then seeing the direction that the science is going. It seems to be anti-beef, anti-dairy, like you said. And I've heard one of you on a podcast in the past say you felt the need to be on the offense with this information, not be so reactive where we let this stretch out for another five years, 10 years, and then all of a sudden we've, we've basically got nothing left. We've got no leg to stand on because the disinformation campaigns have been so rife. So getting back in from tasting the world of, you know, kind of modern scientism, I guess, if you will, to coming back, what are some of the bigger claims or the bigger pieces of misinformation that you think you'd really like to take a stand against? Yeah, I think that, you know, going back to what you said about, um, Sorry, I completely just lost my train of thought. Um, no, going back to what you said, though, about the misinformation and being on the defense, I do think that was like a big problem for a lot of ag. I feel like for years, we absolutely were not even showing up at all to the conversation around sustainability. And then when we did, we came at it with just so much like aggression, like reactive, and it made for a really negative conversation. And I think in ag, we actually have some really beautiful stories and we have some really incredible sustainability things that we've done and that we've carried on throughout the generations and that we've improved on and that we're learning from. And, and so I think for me, some of the, the misinformation, the biggest things is really just like getting out there and actually telling people what it looks like, you know, boots on the ground on farms, uh, instead of just being the reactive approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, on our podcast, we end up what we do, it's a little bit different than a lot of podcasts, because you envision, you know, just like this, you know, conversations back and forth, but it's actually just Tara and I and what we do is um, we take kind of the top three trending topics in the ag and food space for that week. And then we shed our, you know, millennial female perspective on them, as you alluded to, it's a little bit different than your average farmer's opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting because I think the root of that and, you know, talking about this misinformation is that, you know, sound bites have kind of dominated conversations these days. And I think that's one of the bigger issues is that we all see a headline now and we take that verbatim instead of like clicking on it and reading the full article or maybe fact checking the references within the article. And so, you know, being able to have more nuanced conversations has been, you know, very important to us when we're in a society where it's like, how much can you fit in a nine second reel mm -hmm. and how much can you fit in a 15 second story? So, I think we spend a lot of time combating like size misinformation, you know, like big is bad in ag and mm. smaller is better. We spend a lot of time, you know, with the conversation on regenerative versus conventional. We spend a lot of time on like the different labels, like food labels is a really big issue for us. I mean, honestly, I feel like you cannot almost look at agriculture and not find um, a portion to pull out that isn't kind of surrounded and eluded in misinformation. It's a very good point. I think, yeah, with the rise of social media and these little sound bites and these clips that you've got, yeah, the very, I call them like grenades. People can just lob these grenades. And one of my favorite grenades to discuss is the vegan grenade. And they kind of just throw it over the fence. And it, it has this kind of like rainbow facade to it. It's better for you. It's better for the planet. It's better for the animals. And it's going to save the world. And they can throw that grenade and run away. And then you're left mm -hmm. in the wake of the destruction of that, which is like, well, when we start examining those claims on their own merits, it's kind of a house of card that doesn't hold up. And I'd really love to get into some of the, you know, the kind of sound bites that you just raised, like uh, regenerative agriculture versus conventional and greenwashing and labels and such. But before we move into some of those topics, I do want to keep focusing on this like story of women in ag, because it must be different. And I'm curious about your, your experiences personally. What is it like to be a female rancher? Yeah, I think that it has changed a lot from my childhood to now of what it looks like for women to be in ag. I think the conversation is very different. Uh, Natalie and I talked about this on a personal episode that we did that I think one of the things I struggled with growing up is I didn't see a lot of like female roles on the farm, you know, and it wasn't that I was ever like discouraged from going into ag. If anything, my parents were super supportive of, you know, whatever it was that I wanted to do. But I feel like when you don't see yourself represented in an industry, no matter what industry it is, it's hard to like picture yourself there. And so I think that's why originally like I went in a different direction mm -hmm. and I didn't, you know, have the ag 
didn't get my degree in ag and, and didn't see myself on the farm. And so I feel like it's been a journey to get to where I'm at. And, you know, actually just last night, I was having this conversation with someone that, you know, we need more representation of women in agriculture. And I do think it's shifting. Uh, we're seeing more women who own farms on their own, you know, that their mm -hmm. husband is not involved in agriculture. Um, and I think women have also always played a crucial role on the farm and on the ranch, just maybe didn't always get the recognition that they are getting now. Uh, and so I think there's been a big shift and it's exciting to see it happening. I'm a mom of two girls, so currently raising a nine and six year old. And I, you know, I'm excited for, you know, the, where they'll jump in in agriculture. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. As Tara said, it's definitely still a male dominated industry, but uh, that is changing. Um, I think her and I sometimes aren't the best interviews for this question because mm. I do think there has been a lot of females in agriculture who have felt um, like kind of disrespected and had, you know, um, maybe issues being the only women in the room and maybe being questioned and having a little bit of that, um, male versus female energy not respected. Um, I will personally say that I've always had really positive experiences with my role as a female in agriculture, but sometimes I think me talking about that can take away from all the women who have had more of a struggle with it. Yeah, it's a very good point. Like we said as, as well, um, you know, a little earlier that there's nuance in all of these things and to, you know, make blanket statements just because of our personal experiences is sometimes foolish. So I appreciate that nod. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> with, with these other things in the room, like these older kind of misconceptions and, and how things are changing and this m returning back to nature. I'm, I'm always fascinated by like wordplay and relationships and energies and masculine and feminine and stuff. And I love the fact that Mother Earth, right? It is Mother Nature. We go back and I think that there must be some real value there in, in bringing women back more so to work with soil and to work with animals. What have you personally learned about like life or parenting or yourself I know it's a big question, but what have you learned about being more interconnected with Mother Nature, looking at the cycles, looking at animals, stirring death in the face and life in the face? What's it taught you about or has it changed your outlook on life? I think that within agriculture, we do feel really connected, right, to to the earth. And so I do think that it's actually one of the reasons I feel like we take such offense to some of the misinformation and, you know, accusations from, you know, the vegan activists about animal welfare is because we feel so deeply rooted in our cattle and our land and our water. Uh, you know, I always tell people that, you know, especially in the environmental world, when I was working, like that there would be claims out there that, you know, we were destroying the water. And it's like, I drink the exact same water as my cows. It comes from the same tank to their troughs to my house. Mm. And so it was like how, you know, we're so integrated in with our land and our cattle um, that, I don't know. I feel like it, it has taught me a lot, um, especially about like motherhood and teaching my girls. Uh, when we, you know, have our dinner and we're eating, we love to talk about where the food came from. Like, what was the process? Was it our own cows that we're raising? And I feel like that is so missed in a lot of um, households nowadays of not knowing where your food comes from and and not really understanding. You know, you mentioned life and death. Like, that is something that I feel like you know kids on farms experience a lot more growing up with than uh, the everyday person. And I do think it, it really roots you um, into what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah, I think growing up in agriculture, too, is obviously a wonderful way to be raised. But I do think it um, skews it a little bit because it's all we've ever known. Right. So being so connected to the land, spending so much time outside, that is, you know, the way I have lived for 36 years of my life now. And so I always like chuckle isn't the right word, but I'm always, always taken, I guess, aback a little bit when I'm scrolling social media and I'll see people who have to say like, you know, get outside to enjoy, you know, 10 minutes of sunlight first mm -hmm. thing in the morning or, you know, take off your shoes and intentionally try and like touch grass. And I'm like, I just feel so disconnected from that um, viewpoint where you have to like intentionally go out of your way to experience nature. It's like, that's, um, you know, I spend probably 85% of my time outside. And so to, think that there are people who are living so polar opposite of that, I can, it actually really makes me understand why there is so much misinformation and so much misunderstanding about the like agriculture industry and our lifestyle, because I just feel like there is such a difference between the way, you know, some of us are living our lives. And then, you know, the person who's in the middle of like upstate New York is living their life. 
Yeah, I feel that, Natalie. It's it's like you are living more natural um, by accident. You are a biohacker's dream because you're doing yeah. all of the right <laughs> things by organically living. And I've always been fascinated by this ancestral lens on life and to learn that a few cultures, um, you know, indigenous cultures, they don't even have a word for nature because they're, it, mm-hmm. they're like, what do you, what's nature? You mean like this home, like where we live? There's, there's not even separation from it. And now you're right, like concrete jungles and blocks and people take vacations to go back to nature. And you're like, I just live in it. And it's, it's a beautiful juxtaposition. It's an important reminder too, because not everybody can live that life right now. And Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing a trend of people wanting to move back to more of that life. You know, you see in trending topics like homesteading or even people that are in cities, like they're at least trying, you know, they're, they're understanding where they spend the money and vote with the dollar, maybe growing some seeds, like they're participating in the life cycle itself. And Tara, to your point about having conversations about where the food comes from, it it reminded me of a conversation I had with a nephew of mine a few years ago, but we took him through like a Wendy's drive through years ago because that's what he wanted. You know, he's a a kid. He did good at school and like, what do you want? We'll treat you. He's Wendy's. Okay. So we sit down and he's having a (laughs) cheeseburger and I asked him, um, you know, what, what are you eating? What is the burger? And he's like looking at me like I've asked him, you know, what Pythagorean theory is. He has no idea. I'm like, what animal is it? And he's like, uh, is it chicken? I'm like, no, it's not chicken. It's a hamburger. What is it? He, oh, so it's ham. I'm like, no, it's it's a cow. And he's like, oh. And, and, you know, just the disconnect, right? This is at the time, he was probably 11 years old or something like that. A kid who didn't know what he was eating. And I think that level of disconnection is disconcerting. You know, we have children that can name all of the big brand symbols. Like they'll tell you what the golden arches of McDonald's mean. They'll even know what Exxon Mobil is because it's just so ingrained in our culture. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Walmart. But you ask them to name a plant or what animal comes from, or what cut of beef this is, and it's just completely clueless. So I think it's very, very important to connect people to their food, and I and, and I think that kind of pulls us into the next conversation in terms of some of the things that I, I think you bring a lot of nuance to the table with. Sometimes what's a, a consequence of that system is the disconnect between even our beef, right? We, we, we go to the supermarket, we pick it up in these plastic, um, you know, wrappers, and we take it home. We have no idea where it came from, no idea how it was raised. And I think, um, Natalie, you said you did a direct-to-consumer um, model, which obviously puts the consumer a much more closely linked to their food. They know exactly where it's coming from. But how do you square the circle of um, trying to encourage people to have more of a connection to the food and where it comes from without being so elitist that they have to literally go to the ranch every single time and shake the hand of the farmer every single time because we're trying to also find some convenience in a busy world? Yeah, Tara and I have actually a lot of conversations around this because one of the things we do want is people to walk into the grocery store and feel more comfortable with their food choices. I feel like food anxiety is actually a real thing that consumers are experiencing right now, and it actually breaks my heart for them. Mm. You know, we are very fortunate to have a freezer full of beef that we raise ourselves. And so I don't have those questions, but I can remember, I don't know, six months ago, I walked into the grocery store and my husband doesn't like chicken, so we don't buy it a lot. And at this time, you know, now I'm sourcing it actually from a direct to consumer business. But at that time I was buying it from the grocery store and I, you know, walked down to that aisle and I picked up a chicken package and there were labels on there that I didn't understand. And I mm. kind of took me back for a second. I was like, what does this actually mean? And I, um, was a little overwhelmed. And I was like, this isn't right. Like I'm in agriculture. I shouldn't be feeling this way. And it really, again, made me like reconnect with our consumers and all the questions they have walking to the grocery store. And so, you know, going back to your question, I do want people to be able to walk in there and understand that maybe some of those labels don't actually mean anything. You know, some of labels I think have turned to like a marketing standpoint Mm -hmm. more today than they actually are even information for the consumer. And so, you know, there's two ways to shop. There is going into the grocery store and sourcing your beef that way. And then like you mentioned, there's kind of the direct to consumer route. And I want people to feel comfortable doing both because at the root of it, um, a lot of animals are going to be raised the same way. There's definitely differences when you're sourcing direct to consumer that, you know, we can get into reasons why you would and some of the benefits of it. But at the end of the day, you know, we're our operation we sell our beef the very traditional route. So it's going to go to the sale bar and it's going to get end up being bought by a feedlot and it's going to enter the conventional food chain. So it's either going to go to a grocery store or a restaurant. I am very, very proud of the way we raise our beef. I know that we are um, not the anomaly when it comes to the beef industry. I know our neighbors are raising their cattle the same way. I know my family is, our friends, and I know other ranches across the industry that are you know predominantly family owned and operated are doing it the same way. And so I do want to take away that fear that if you are just going into the grocery store, 
that that beat is, you know, beef is unhealthy for you or it's bad mm-hmm. or it's, you know, tainted in some way because yes, there again, there are differences between it and the direct consumer route. But at the end of the day, that's still a very nutritious, safe product that you can go in at a very affordable, you know, easy, simple way. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. On the dairy side, I always tell people, I mean, I get asked, well, you know, what milk do you buy? I'm like, I buy the cheapest milk on the shelf, like whatever is on sale, because I know exactly what went into making it. Um, even our milk, it goes to cheese. It goes to like Walmart brand cheese. Like I'm like, you know, just because you're getting the great value brand of something doesn't mean it's not made with like a really high quality product. Like I always am like, I'll put our milk quality up against anyone in the countries. And, you know, it's going into different large name brands like Subway. If you've had cheese from Subway, it comes from our local cheese plant. And so, you know, it doesn't just because it is, you know, the cheaper brand or whatever doesn't mean it's bad. And I think that is something that we have lost in some of these conversations is that like you have to buy, you know, the organic, you have to buy the the one, the thing with all the labels mm-hmm. on it just to be a healthy, nutritious product or it to be good quality. And, you know, I definitely don't stand by that. Like I believe in our food system and not saying it couldn't change and doesn't need to be worked on. But um, I know as a dairy farmer going in and picking whatever milk on the shelf, I can feel really good about it. And that's what I want for other people too, like going to that anxiety that people experience or food guilt. Um, you know, we have, we're in a world where we have a lot of social media of people saying different things. And, and sometimes I feel like the extreme things that get said, you know, gets views, right? Mm-hmm. Like gets downloads, gets whatever. And so uh, these kind of conversations get lost in there. I, yeah, I think it's a very important topic. And I, I've fallen victim to this myself. You know, I've, I felt the food guilt because I talk about a lot of these topics. And we talk to world famous regenerative farmers, too. And we all care about the future. We all care about soil health. We all care about this. And I'll vote with my dollar to the best of my ability when I can. And then sometimes I end up in Sam's Club and I buy some skirt steak because skirt steak's delicious. And I listen to what my body tells me. Like, I feel great when I eat that too. It's not like I think we can paint sometimes these two extreme visions that just because it's quote unquote conventional, that it's all nasty and these cows are all knee deep in their own shit and they're being pumped full of all of these toxic chemicals and Bill Gates is out there sprinkling furry dust on them to poison you and make you allergic to beef. So my question there is... You do it. You're, you're the boots on the ground. You see these practices. Is there a range? Is there like even within the conventional model, even if you're not getting into all these greenwashing labels and buying USDA certified organic labels, which seems corrupt as well as far as I can see it. But is there a range in the quality of, of conventional too? Or is it all standardized so much that you feel comfortable pretty much wherever you go, whenever you go, you're going to get a solid product? Yeah, I mean, I think it, when it comes to beef, we do have a grading system. So if you are, you know, getting a prime steak somewhere, you should be getting a the same prime steak anywhere, right? Like mm. it is graded, um, you know, across the board. So it should be same whether it's prime, conventional, or choice. Um, I think the ground products vary quite differently, um, and I think you can get into other, you know, like um, eggs can be raised differently. I think chicken could look a little bit different than, uh, you know, beef. I mean, that's one thing that I kind of stand on a soapbox as is like all animal proteins get lumped together. Mm. Um, you know, and I would say that the beef industry is the most segmented industry, whereas, you know, like chicken and pork are going to be vertically integrated. Um, that is not the case when it comes to the beef supply in the U S and I think that's something that consumers aren't aware of. So, For example, to break that down further, you know, for anyone who's unfamiliar with some of the terms I'm using, uh, for chicken, let's say the easiest would be Tyson. Everyone knows the brand Tyson, right? So when you think of chicken, Tyson could own the product from the very beginning all the way to the very end. So they own the egg at the beginning. They are managing, you know, the farmer is almost like kind of an employee of them, right? Like they're working for the Tyson brand. They're, they're, They're raising the chicken, but it's essentially Tyson who owns it. And it gets carried all the way to the very end of the supply chain. That is not at all how the beef industry works. It's very segmented. You know, the animal's going to start an operation like mine and my husband's. It's called a cow-calf operation. And we're essentially in charge of raising an animal from birth all the way up to a certain age Mm -hmm. um, or weight. And then that gets, we sell off our animal. You know, then it's bought by usually a backgrounder. And then they raise it to another stage. And then that is sold to the feedlot. And then they raise it to, you know, the the last four months of their life, which then sold to the the processor, the harvester. And so... It's very, very segmented. Um, it really is families at each, you know, end of the operation. And there's, you know, 
varying sizes between those too. Mm. You know, there's going to be larger cow calf operations, which we are where we run a larger herd. I mean, the average size herd is 43 and we're well, you know, close to almost a thousand. So we are a much larger cow calf operation than um, other cow calf operations. Um, you know, I, the same thing with feedlots, there could be a very small feedlot and very large feedlots. Um, I actually toured a feedlot for the first time. Um, I don't know, a month ago, it was over a hundred thousand head feedlot. And so I was very wow. curious what I was going to be walking into. Um, as you, you mentioned, um, I, you see a lot of pretty nasty images of, uh, feedlots and, and honestly, that's what they show in any docuseries mm. when they talk about, you know, beef production, they aren't showing, you know, the cow calf operation with us out at pasture with our animals grazing. What they're showing is a feedlot. That's usually what they're panning over. And that's how they paint the whole beef industry. Um, I have to say, I was actually pretty impressed by the hundred thousand head feedlot. I left there thinking they had really good management in place. You know, they are uh, herd health was wonderful. Um, their feeding was down tight. I mean, I, their pens I thought were really clean. Like I was really impressed with that large of a scale. I have not toured every single feedlot in the U.S., so I can't speak to it all. I think that goes into the nuance of the conversation. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think we need to be more open to the idea that, um, again, you get shown one thing and it isn't a copy repeat for every single operation across the U.S. And so just because you maybe see an outlier where an animal was maybe not cared for in the best route, it is not a reflection of the entire industry. Um, and I just don't think you can paint it that way either. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add on that, Tara, from more of the dairy standpoint, I guess? Yeah, I can talk a little bit more about like on farm. I know you talked about like regenerative and um, I do think it's like a, a spectrum in the when you think about like regenerative. I feel like there's one thing that regenerative is not. It's not necessarily like a check the box. Like it's not an organic label, right, where you like fill out all the paperwork and you get an organic certification mm -hmm. and you do all the things. Um, and so I do think that that part of the conversation gets missed in the conventional side of things. Like we, I'm um, said we're a conventional dairy, so we are not necessarily claiming to be regenerative, but we compost all of our manure and it goes out to local farmers, um, onto their fields. Um, uh, you know, we're doing lots of different things that I would put under kind of more the regenerative box. And so that's why I personally like to look at it as a spectrum that every year we're working towards doing a little bit better, adding a new practice, um, changing things up, whether that is doing minimal till or no till or mm. all of these different things. And, you know, Natalie said it, like, I, I don't think our dairy Dairy is the outlier. I think dairies across the country are all doing different things to try to be a little bit better year after year. Uh, and so there is lots of conventional farmers out there still doing some, you know, really great regenerative practices, even if they're not necessarily labeling themselves as that. Um, and I think it's really incredible. I feel like the more and more dairies and farms and ranches that I have gone and seen or people I've talked to, like they are all trying, you know, to do better year over year. Um, and it makes me kind of excited, I think, for the future of uh, where agriculture is going and where we're headed. Yeah. I want to add to something. Sorry, I want to add to something that Tara said, because I think it's really important to like kind of even further drive that home. I asked my husband the other day if he would call himself a regenerative rancher, because I'm just very I'm actually working on a keynote speech about like labels within the ag industry. And I find it so interesting that some people really stick to that title and they really like claim themselves. I'm a regenerative rancher. I have a regenerative operation. And then there's people who don't use that term. And so I asked my husband, I said, would you ever, you know, call yourself a regenerative rancher, label yourself that, or, you know, in conversation, if you're at a conference, would you use that term? And he was like, no, I, you know, no, probably not. But I would consider our operation extremely regenerative. I mean, we have been doing cover crops for, I don't know, almost 20 years. We've been no till that whole entire time. Um, we rotationally graze. We work really closely with our local NRCS. We have butterfly habitats on our operation. Mm -hmm. We do wildlife, um, you know, uh, work with them for, you know, different, um, lacking the word right now, but we have, we have really, I think, great water management. I mean, we, I would consider ourselves extremely regenerative and yet my husband would never label himself that or call it that. And so I do think we're losing, um, I mean, it's definitely a disservice to ourselves in the industry, but I think we're losing the consumer in all of this by saying mm. like, it's black or white, it is regenerative or conventional. There's nothing in between. And just, um, I don't know. I think it's just a really, I love that consumers are connecting with the term regenerative and I love that operations are using the term regenerative, but sometimes I think that I just don't know if it's doing the best for like reconnecting consumers back to the food and how it's, it's being raised and like, um, you know, feeling safer, more connected and trusted to the sources by just like slapping that label on it. 
Yeah, no, I think it's a, a very important point. And I think it makes a lot of sense when you chat to people that are actually doing it, because I think the assumption that if you've positioned regenerative as, as the be all and end all in your head, that anything that is not that is destructive. And that doesn't make sense because why would you want to destroy your own practices and your own soils? Because you find that the bulk of farming and ranches are generational and you're trying to ensure and, and create safety in that resilient system, right? You want it to be able to be passed on to your family if they want to do it. It wouldn't make much sense for people to be out there just saying, ah, whatever, we'll destroy this and, and it doesn't matter, or even treat the animals so poorly because humans are generally good, I believe. A lot of those images that you said, they get sticky, they get thrown around in these documentaries. I did some research on, and also found that a lot of those, um, you know, the footage that's used that's propositioned as being footage from America isn't even often in this country. It's in different countries and things like that, but they're so sticky and they're so emotive. I think there is not a healthy person on the earth that would watch a cow getting kicked or something that wouldn't feel it. But that's why it's so sticky and that's why it's so hard to get back on the other side of that, right? Because it's just so emotional. And um, I think to hear you talk about it from your like boots on the ground experience and even using terms like, you know, we use cover crops, we rotationally graze. These are regenerative principles. They're just not operating under that, that umbrella. And I think sometimes we do need to be careful with terms because terms can immediately trap us in a belief system and it closes off the rest of the conversation from happening to anybody that sits outside of that. So let, let's talk about a few of those labels or terms in, in a bit more depth. Natalie, you said you were working on something like this, but I'm also very curious about the the whole greenwashing thing. And I always laugh, you know, when I see, you know, vegetarian fed hen chicken boxes as like a thing and you're like, ah, they're, they're, they're little dinosaurs. They eat everything. And, you know, grass fed can mean one thing, but it doesn't mean grass finish. And is that even what you want? And I, Will Harris told me a few weeks ago that there's a, now a loophole where they can say this is U.S. beef, but it could have been processed even in a different country. So there's just a whole lot of confusion here. What are maybe some of the biggest uh, label misconceptions or greenwashing um, things that are going on in the industry right now? Yeah, I'll start with the greenwashing and Natalie can kind of get into the labels on the beef side. I do think there's a ton of green um, greenwashing. I feel like it's a fairly new term, but it is pretty like rampant. We've covered it a few times on Discover Ag um, cases where companies have said different things and it you know turned out to not be quite what they said. Like you mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation, the blanket statements that like, oh, vegan is healthy. It's a better food. It, it does all these things. And that's not necessarily what it means at all. And I feel like one of the things that I get frustrated with is within like, you know, beef and dairy, we are regulated when we promote our products within USDA. So everything has to go through USDA before we can say anything about our product. We can't necessarily like go after another product. And obviously all these laws are in place for a reason, but that puts us at a disadvantage when we're up against companies that can basically say whatever they want or put whatever they want on their label without any regulation. Uh, you know, we've been seeing lab grown meat and it's mm. being, you know, said that it's better for the environment. You know, we're getting research now out of universities that are saying it's actually 25 times higher of a carbon footprint than conventional beef, mm. which is really no surprise to anyone if you look at how it's produced. Like if you are putting something in a lab and it has to be climate controlled and all these different things and all these inputs, obviously it's going to have a higher carbon footprint, but they can get away with saying that because of such you know little regulation over that. And so I do think that that greenwashing is just rampant within companies and and really even like the if you're purchasing carbon credits to be able to claim neutrality like is that really doing what it's supposed to like is that really doing what consumers think it's doing that you can say you're carbon neutral when really you wrote a check for it basically mm. um and so it, it's i think that we're going to see more and more companies that are getting called out on these greenwashing claims um and that they've been you know bashing animal ag in with such force over the last decade um i do think there's going to be a changing of the tide uh in next coming years yeah getting into uh labels so the label conversation i generally don't like any labels anymore in the grocery mm -hmm. store um i which is why i always tell people like if you really want to you know, know that animal was, let's say grass, grass fed and finished is important to you. Like that's what you want. Um, or if you want a U.S. product or you want, uh, you know, all natural is another one, right. Um, or if you want no, you know, if you care that much about the product you're sourcing, 
that's when you go direct to consumer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Don't trust the grocery store labels. Um, otherwise just go to the grocery store and pick out any, basically any beef product because they're probably isn't, I would bet, I mean, there might be minute differences between them, but all of them are going to be free of antibiotics. You know, um, all of them are going to be whatever the all natural meant. Um, unless you're looking for grass finish first, you know, grain finish, that's, that's one that would differ, but the other labels, I don't even like technically know what's, what, what would distinguish between one beef package and the other. So if you care about knowing like what the animal was fed, uh, you know, how it was raised, go the direct to consumer route. Otherwise just go in the grocery store and buy whatever, like whichever package you want at the price you want, because in my mind, there probably isn't going to be enough difference between the steak on the left and the steak on the right to justify a $4 price difference. Well, and I think one of the things with like the grass fed that people like don't even realize is we import a majority of our grass fed beef. So like, if that's something you care about, like you probably should source it directly from the rancher because otherwise if you're buying grass fed because you think it's like better for the environment, but it's being sourced all the way from New Zealand, like <laughs> what's the trade off there of, you know, your food miles and, mm -hmm. um, again, like the carbon output of that. And so I do feel like there is, um, these labels. Yeah. And you mentioned like the country of origin label that things can be packaged here in the United States and the animal can actually be, you know, raised somewhere else. Um, and so there is, and I don't necessarily think that's a, like bad. It just, when people see product of the U.S., I think in their mind, they think it means something that it doesn't. And mm -hmm. so these labels get very confusing very quickly. Yep. It's one thing to say vote with your dollar and then people are trying to vote with the dollar and where the votes actually being cast is nothing like they thought it was because of all the confusion. Now, I, I could be wrong here or they could have updated their stances, but I remember years ago I used to use ButcherBox and then I found out, yeah, a lot of it was coming from Australia and New Zealand. And you, you see very cleverly, they don't out and out say it, but they very cleverly make it look like this is all local, like beautiful farms right here in the US. And you're like, oh, damn, you know, there's there's a lot of trickery going on and, you know, incentives and, you know, money corrupts and all of that stuff. So I think, you know, you made a very good point, Natalie, about if you care that much and you're in a position to really vote with your dollar and be intentional, then go go to the farmers, go to the farmers market or now get online. You know, that's the wonderful mm -hmm. thing about this. We can get online and figure all this stuff out. I think it's kind of like getting above this Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like once we get above that base layer, we can worry about this stuff. A lot of the time it just adds to the muck and the mire and it's confusing people. It's giving them that anxiety. And then all of a sudden they might just opt out of beef altogether. They're just like, well, I don't know. And they said this is full of nonsense so i'm just going to eat broccoli instead and we just want more than anything else people with the most nutrient dense foods on their plates and in their mouths and then it's a sliding scale of what you want where you want to vote with your dollar and how you can afford to do that so a big um elephant in the room here with with this you guys getting on the front foot and fighting misinformation slash dis disinformation is the use of these very well put together docu-series, uh, things like Cowspiracy, What the Health, uh, Forks Over Knives. There's been a bunch of them. And I know you've you've challenged these in your own podcast, but what is your reaction to these um, sticky, well-produced, heavily funded documentaries that attack the animal uh, agriculture industry like Cowspiracy, et cetera? Yeah, we did do a summer like debunking series where every month we watched one of those um, videos. I, don't, I hate calling them like documentaries because I feel like that is not an accurate representation. Um, and it was really fascinating to go through them like point by point and see where they were wrong. We brought on some different experts. We brought on like a registered dietitian to, to cover game changers with us, which was really mm -hmm. helpful to see their perspective on, uh, you know, the plant versus animal protein conversation. And uh, they definitely take one point, right, and run with it. Mm -hmm. uh, whether, like Natalie said, they show, you know, they say this is the beef industry and they show just a feedlot. And you're like, there's so much more to this conversation. Um, we also found a lot of the facts were super misleading. You know, one of them, I forget which, I think it was Food Inc. I can't remember which one it was, that um, was using outdated information from like the UN's Livestock Long Shadow, even though those numbers had been withdrawn and proven incorrect. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's no like, notice on it on Netflix when you watch it saying like this is outdated or this is you know I think there should be some kind of disclaimer now on some of those videos or uh, movies that have been um, disproved and so 
you know, we, for sea spiracy, we brought on a seafood expert and I found that one to be very fascinating mm-hmm. getting their perspective because there was so much misinformation in that video. And, and that was the case with all of them. Um, you know, Natalie and I personally, a uh, part of our uh, podcast is that we have been working on a docu-series where we'd be able to highlight different pieces of agriculture uh, and be able to cast, you know, agriculture in a more truthful light and, and bring that nuance to the conversation. If I could tell anyone who is watching any of those films one thing, I would tell them to remember to watch this film knowing that there was an agenda, Mm -hmm. that this film was made with an agenda. And that is going to sway every single thing they do without this film. Um, Of course, they're going to find the one vegan ex-rancher that will tout the animal industry to put in their film. They are going to find the one person that can do that. Of course, they are going to, you know, do leading conversations and only include part of the film the conversations from the interviews that they want like that the those films are made to get people to stop eating meat that is the agenda and so they're not going to show wide range of conversations they're not going to have nuanced conversations they're not going to have differing perspectives you know they're not going to show that they're going to show the one thing they want to show and they're going to find the most compelling emotional way to show that Mm -hmm. i know there was that one of the families that was interviewed um, they're a california family they're direct consumer And she has come out and said since, like, they twisted my words. They were leading conversations. This is actually what I said. They left out this portion. I mean, they basically debunked, you know, everything that that film, the whole, their whole portion in it. They were like, that was not an accurate presentation of how we portrayed. And people don't know that. They just know that, oh, there's an ex, you know, the vegan rancher who hates the industry. There's this rancher that said these things. and, And then they go with it. And it's like, you have to understand those films are made with an agenda. Yeah, I think too. A few of the people that we um, interviewed actually were like, um, for Seaspiracy, we interviewed Valentine Thomas. And she said she had reached out and said, like, I would love to be a part of this. Like, can Mm. I help find people for you to interview? And basically got completely, you know, shut down. Obviously, they did not want to interview her or other people. And that just like it really like compounded, you know, how I felt about the the movie that was like you wouldn't even bring on like the counter point and have this actual discussion same with Vinny Tortorich when we interviewed him like he had invited people to come on to his uh film and of course in no response no one would come on and so if you can't like come to the table and actually have a conversation and discussion about this like you're you clearly do have that agenda as Natalie mentioned it's very very important for people to consider that I think and I, I almost fell victim to it because Cowspiracy came out a long time ago now. And I remember um, it was long before I was in this world of even talking to farmers and ranchers. And I remember like watching that documentary and sitting with myself like, damn, I got some hard decisions to make. But then there was still a thread of curiosity and uh, like this little thing that was left in me that went, but documentaries are designed to basically feed you a narrative and confirm that that is the way so let me do some counter arguing with this thing and it turns out that yeah it's it's a lot of uh, mistruths just blatantly and it seems like it's easier to trick people than it is to convince them that they were tricked and these are really good at doing that so the solution i'm guessing this is where it gets into your journey into podcasting and such is to continue to be a beacon of truth and to have more nuanced conversations like you say to invite experts on that challenge the dominant narratives because these are the dominant narratives now there's a lot of money behind them there's a lot of funding behind them this is a lot of products that are being sold on the back of them etc so you're the definition of what i would call like the the modern farmers the modern ranchers you've got you know your boots in the soil and you know a pitchfork in one hand and then you know a selfie in the other hand as you're trying (laughs) to tell these stories and show it and then you're taking into the podcasting so you know, obviously there's some great episodes for people to go check out there over on your podcast, but what's the general hope, you know, with Discover Ag, with this more modern stance of bringing people closer and showing them and challenging these, what's the overarching goal or, or what are you hoping to get done with Discover Ag and your roles in this of, of kind of combating the misinformation? What do you want to show? I think that at its core, even the name is like discover ag. We want people to find out more about ag. Uh, Natalie and I both are firm believers in food choice. Like it is not about whether we're not here to tell you, you have to have conventional beef or grass fed or anything. Actually, we just believe that you should go into it knowing information about your food. And so I feel like that's really our goal is like, here are the, here's all the information, lay it all out. And then you go and make the informed decision that's best for your family, your budget, your diet, your, your body. Uh, you mentioned listening to your body. And I, I love that you said that because I think that's such an important piece of this conversation around what 
to nourish our bodies with. And so I think at the root, that's really what we want is people to just have the information to go and then make the decision that makes sense for them. Uh, Natalie has a quote that she always says, I'm surprised she hasn't brought it up yet. So I will, but it's like, tell me what you care about. And I'll tell you what product to buy. Like there's going to be different products for different reasons, different food choices for different reasons for different people. Um, and so I think that's really at our core, what we want is people to feel good about whatever food they're choosing. Another one of my favorite sound bites um, is, well, quotes is that um, headlines are the enemy of conversation. And mm -hmm. I think that that's one thing our podcast really stands for and I hope will um, remind people of. And kind of like you just said, get people back to that desire to want to take more initiative for themselves to challenge headlines, challenge things people are telling them, challenge, you know, a reel they see, a documentary they see, a podcast they listen to. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of information out there at your fingertips and the algorithm is designed to feed you what you want to. Like I can get on there and whatever my stance is that I want to find, if I want to support something in the opposite of what I believe, I could go out there and find it. I could find one paper that has the study for me to run wild with if I want it to, no matter what my thought or belief is. And so I think I just really want to bring that idea that like there are layers, like the food industry is an onion and the more you peel back you know, the different layers, the more you're going to feel better about walking to the grocery store and buying whatever end product it is. Like Tara said, we will always stand for food choice. Our, we are not here to tell you, you know, this one is better than this one or pick this one. This is the only answer. This is the best answer because it is going to be across the board different for every single family across the U.S. And I just don't subscribe to the idea that there is one way to shop for um, you and your family that is like a one size fits all that is going to fit everyone. And so I just want to bring that conversation back and reconnect people back to agriculture and do it in a really like fun and exciting and informative way where, like you said, they're not learning from the man and the bibs with the wheat in his straw. You know, they're connecting to two millennial women that like pop culture and are up on, you know, Travis and Taylor's romance as much as they are and can mm. just really like bring a different perspective um, to agriculture and food that they're not used to. Well said. And I think that, yeah, the power of story and bringing people into that is really what they'll connect with and hopefully see it. And I love that you use the analogy of the onion because I use that all the time. And like you said, there's many layers. And if you spend enough time peeling onions, you end up crying. And probably the crying here <laughs> is because you start to realize that there is a lot of stuff you don't know. I always say like the less we know, the more stubbornly we know it. And the peeling of the onion is kind of challenging that Dunning-Kruger effect of like the more you learn, the more you realize there are infinite open loops around this stuff. And that word nuance is very, very important because it's very lost in our culture. Like you alluded to the echo chambers that you can find yourself in because your algorithm knows you better than you know yourself sometimes. So it feeds you exactly what you want to see. And then you're like, yeah, see, I was right. And you have to be very aware of not falling into that and getting so trapped. Always remain curious. Always stay open to the possibility that you are wrong. And then listen to your heart. Decide what feels like the most truth for you. Run with that thing. Be authentic and tell your story. So I am curious, like before we, we're going to bring a caller on and chat just in a second, but I am curious to ask you about another let's say a myth. And obviously I think that you're very gung ho on putting some good old red meat on the plate and eating some milk or drinking some milk rather. But what, what do you feel about this idea that it's not very uh, woman like to be chowing down on steaks and the, the vegans, I think it's about 70% uh, are female and they definitely push more towards like, maybe you just get a little piece of fish, but mostly you get the salad. So how are you fighting back against that one as well? Are you just, you know, chowing down on meat? What's uh, the bulk of your diet look like and, and how much uh, you know, are you prioritizing animal protein? Yeah, it is funny that it that women it has been like painted definitely more as the vegan, which is kind of concerning when you really think about like women's health and what we need for our bodies. Like we need to be, you know, getting iron and nobody's talking about that when we brought on the registered dietitian for uh debunking game changers that was one of the things we talked about was like women's health and and the need of animal protein in our diets um i will say i think i speak for natalie and i both that when we plan our plates we plan our plates around uh the animal protein which is usually beef on both of our plates um we also are big fish eaters i know in both of our households uh and so yeah planning that entire meal it's like we start with the steak and then we work our way out from there. Uh, so yeah, I've never understood that, um, that trope of kind of like, you know, you, if you go on a first date, like don't order the ribs and like order it, order, yeah. order the steak, order whatever it is that you want. Um, because I mean, who doesn't love a good steak male or female? 
Yeah. Like Tara said, um, it is actually starting to be really concerning about the way women are, um, really taking care of our bodies based off of how society thinks we should or doing it based off how society is telling us to do it. Um, the more and more learning I've done, uh, because I've always grown up right with eat, eating meat on my plate. Like that has just been a staple again for 36 years of my life. So I've never really thought much about it or questioned it, but the more and more I'm getting into it, the more and more I real, like, realize how important protein really is for mm. our bodies, especially as women and how important muscle is to carry us into our older ages. And so I am really focusing on like high protein and, and actually like lifting weights um, and putting on as much muscle as I can, because the thing that's going to carry us forward the best to like live later, you know, 40, 50, 60s, 70s, 80s, and, you know, whoever knows how long um, is going to be having that protein and that muscle mass to carry us for our bodies. And I just, it really breaks my heart that women are like almost doing the exact opposite, right? Like we're ingrained to do like just mm -hmm. yoga and then eat the, eat the salads. And it's like, I feel like we're getting to a point where, um, we're really doing a disservice to our bodies. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's funny reflecting on that. My the first date with my now wife, she took me to Texas Roadhouse and ordered um, <laughs> like a twenty ounce ribeye, and I was like, okay, I like where this is going. I like it. I like it. Have you uh, both been organ pilled yet? Are you are you trying? Are you weaving in any of the organs? Are you doing any supplements? Are you just you know raw dog in some liver or some heart? What's going on over there? Yeah, we have yeah. both been kind of on a, I don't know, journey of figuring out maybe some supplements and different things. So Natalie started on the beef liver pills and convinced me to do them. And then I started um, actually doing some colostrum powder. So mm. um, and then I hooked Natalie on that as well. So one of us finds something we love. We definitely uh, encourage the other one to do it. Let's go. Yeah, I've also been really intrigued about um, melding organs into your ground beef. Mm -hmm. um, and I have been wanting to talk to our local butcher to see if he could do that, because I think that would be really phenomenal. I don't know. Like you said, I don't know if I could just chow down on a piece of liver yeah. <laughs> at this point in my life. It might be a little late for me to adapt my taste buds to that or want to when I can conveniently get it in a pill form. Um, but I am a big you know, something I, that wasn't something on our plate growing up and now learning more about it. I am a big believer in getting like the, those organ meats into your diet. And so whether it's through supplementation or for anyone who's listening, um, that maybe feels comfortable enough to going to their local butcher that like does order, um, you know, has a direct consumer or something that way, um, inquire if they can meld the organs in there, because I think it's starting to become a little bit more well-known and, um, some butchers might start doing that. Yeah, that, that's really, that's really cool. And I think you, you know, I think about stacking big rocks before we get into stacking little rocks. And, you know, I think both of what you said there in terms of building the plate outwardly from the center of protein, a good chunk of red meat on the plate, and then, you know, add in whatever comes after that. And then the resistance training and the connection to nature, that's the stuff that's going to take you 90% of the way there. And then sprinkling in these other things is going to take you, you know, all the way for the home run. So it's really cool to hear that. So I've just got a, one more, one more little thing for you. Uh, we have a, a question submitted through our community. So we're going to have that read off and we'll just powwow on it and then, uh, and then we'll wrap this thing up. So Cade, can you read us what we got submitted through the community, please? Yeah, for sure. So this question is, what are your thoughts on the dangers of raw milk consumption? Ooh, Tara, it's probably a good one for you, huh? <laughs> yeah, funny that you would ask. I feel like raw milk right now is just trending everywhere. It's like the number one question I get. So I am not surprised to hear that one at all. So I actually, a little bit of my history, I think it's like relevant here. I drink raw milk for about the first 25 years of my life. Um, and not while I was in college, obviously, because I was not sourcing it from my farm. And But I um, ultimately decided to go to just pasteurized conventional milk. Um, and as I mentioned, now that is what I drink. Um, so I've done a bit of both. Um, I do not fall into the camp of thinking that raw milk has like extreme health benefits. I think milk um, and steak as whole foods are just powerhouses on their own. Um, so I personally choose to do pasteurized. Uh, I believe that the nutrients are still there and all of those things, you know, that I believe it's backed by science, some really great studies out there. But I will say, um, as a person who does stand for food choice, if you ultimately decide to do raw milk, I think that you have to do that knowing um, that you're accepting some risk. I do think sometimes uh, the risks are overblown by people, but there are risks there, especially for younger children and the elderly. Um, so if you are choosing to consume raw milk, I recommend, you know, 
kind of knowing your farmer, knowing what their sanitation practices are, know what their different counts are for bacteria levels at their farm. Like what are, what all are they testing for? Like do your due diligence if you're making that choice. Um, but if you are not making that choice, I feel like you can feel really good about pasteurized milk. That is, you know, as I've said, what I personally choose and what I choose for my family. Natalie, you got anything though? You chugging on some raw milk or some conventional? You doing any of it? What about what about almond milk? That's not very good, is it? Like we're, we're talking about real milks and that. What, what about nut milks or anything? What's going? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have actually never tried any other milk on the market besides just a conventional store bought cow's milk. So I am not your go to gal for you know uh, nuanced conversation and different perspectives. Um, but I do, you know, think it's important for different options for people. Like Tara said, one of my favorite quotes is like, tell me what you care about most and I'll tell you the product to choose for. And so I do think there is a purpose, you know, for some people to source almond milk, um, over cow's milk. And, uh, maybe there's a purpose for someone to choose raw milk over conventional milk. And so I think at the root of it, what Tara stated is, you know, perfectly said, it's like, just do the research behind the product you're choosing so that you make sure you're choosing it for the right reason. Don't choose, you know, almond milk because you think it's just better for the environment or don't choose, you know, raw milk because you think it's like superior and going to cure your asthma or something else. Mm -hmm. It's like do the the reason behind it. And then if it fits and it, it makes sense, um, then then source that product. Yeah, I think the overarching theme here is uh, freedom of choice, but empowered choice, you know, like mm -hmm. we, we can certainly get evangelical in, the, in these spaces about certain things like we're huge proponents of raw milk. And but I have seen different sides of the coin, like I've seen I've had clients personally that that's that proclaim they were severely lactose intolerant. They couldn't do conventional dairy. And I'm like, well, let's try raw milk, see what happens. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, they can consume it. So there's something going on. And I've also seen other people that have been told, oh, you'll have no problems with raw milk. And they go and try it and they still don't sit right with them. And it's it's not always, um, you know, this one hard rule for everyone it's different strokes for different folks and i think above all else if you're going to get raw milk like you said is just knowing where it comes from that is very important to know those sanitary practices because if you are getting clean good raw milk i mean there's risk with everything right there's risk getting in your car technically there's more risk getting in your car to go pick up your raw milk than the fact that you'll ever die from raw milk but there is risk in everything so we just have to make conscious aware choices we I actually say covered we actually covered raw milk on the podcast this week because it's in the news right now with a couple states that are legalizing it. And um, yeah, it's exactly what you said. I mean, we I said that like I think both sides um, sometimes overstate their opinion about raw milk. You know that, that I've seen some wild claims of all the things that can cure, and then I've seen some wild claims of how risky it is to consume. And so it's like you know both are extreme views, and it's probably somewhere actually in the middle of mm. where it act is actually truth. Um, and so that's kind of the camp that I fall into. I was going to say kind of what Tara said, but I do think it's exciting for the raw milk community about how states are starting to maybe look into this a little bit more. North Dakota just passed it and Colorado is like looking actively to try and pass it. It's kind of interesting how they're using it uh, within their, uh, voting, um, to kind of like sway, mm. uh, political things in Colorado. They've had some interesting things going on that we covered. And so do you think there's real movement for people who are in the raw milk community they are interested in it? Because um, I do think it's interesting that you could live in Nebraska and we could source it, but our, one of our neighboring states, you can't. And I think that is probably very extremely frustrating for a consumer um, to have that choice taken from them. Yeah, no doubt. It, it's confusing. And then it becomes politicized and it's used as a weapon. I don't know whether you saw the articles going around not too long ago that, you know, raw milk was all for these far right extremists. And, you know, it like it, it starts to be used to curate the narrative and it, it's really confusing and you said a very important point there Tara about the truth is usually in the middle somewhere but the middle has become no man's land or no woman's land and people don't feel comfortable standing there because mm -hmm. if if your if your whole suite of beliefs is packaged as a complete bought and paid for ideology as a fealty to either side of a political spectrum or something then you're not really a thinker I've never met anybody that I agree with on every single thing but we've got a lot of just really monocropped thinking now that if I know your opinion on who you voted for, then I know your opinion on all of these things. And if it was over here, I know all of these things. But the truth is nuanced and the truth is often in the middle. And the truth can sometimes be subjective too. What is true for you is not true for me. And I think that's very important to consider.
Very important. And like you said, um, it is really sad to see that food has become a political issue because if anything, it should be the one thing that unites us. Like food choice should be what everyone advocates for. The vegan shouldn't be told that they can't eat vegan and that they can only eat meat. And the meat eater shouldn't be told that they can't eat meat. They can only eat vegan. Um, and so it's really, it just baffles me how we can't come together and stand for the idea of food choice. Mm. Um, and that what's best, like you said, what's best for me and my truth is mine and what's best for you and your truth is yours. Tara, Natalie, thank you very much. This was a fun uh, conversation and I enjoyed the scope and the nuance uh, and, and the search for just figuring out something that we can get closer to the truth together by having these conversations. Um, where can people go to stay up to date with what you're up to and what you're doing with Discover Ag and your personal um, you know, accounts and all that stuff? Tell the people where to go. Yeah, if you're listening to this, you obviously love podcasts and these kind of conversations. So I hope you'll check us out over on Discover Ag, our podcast. And then you can follow our personal um, accounts on all social media sites. I'm at Tara Vanderdusen, Natalie's at Natalie Kavork. And um, yeah, you can find us, you know, on all the usual channels across the internet. Beautiful. Natalie, are we going to see you in season six of Yellowstone? <laughs> You know, you never know. <laughs> okay, good. Stay, stay, stay radical. Stay kicking ass. Thank you for all that you do. And thank you for showing up today. And uh, you lot, we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. All right, friends. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Radical Health Radio. We got a fresh new podcast for you every Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, consider liking, subscribing, reviewing, and rating us on your podcast platform. It helps to spread this message of radical health. We'll see you next week.